Behold what man of love is this that has been manifested in our very presence. Behold what man of love is this that draws us here at this moment, in this place, at this time. Behold what man of love is this that God has blessed each of us to be related, to be connected with J. Philip Sanford. And so we come. We come gathered with the Sanford family in celebrating the life of one who has touched thousands. And so we come. We come to lift up our voices in song of praise to God by the testimonies that we give to the life of Dr. Sanford. This is a moment of celebration. This is a moment of reflection. This is a moment of great thanksgiving. For God has indeed blessed us richly to say that we are related. Family members, useless family members, we come. And Jay Sanford did more than anyone else to form us as a family. And so we come to celebrate his life. I give you good news from the writings of Paul. In writing to the church at Corinth, he spoke to the issue of grief and sorrow and death. And he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 50, I de declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? It's in this hour that we come in a victorious spirit, witnessing to what God has blessed us with. Dr. Sanford and what he has meant to us and what he continues to mean to this great institution. Indeed, the Eusis family has gathered. Indeed, for the Sanford family, we are your family members by spirit because Jay Sanford has blessed us all richly. It's an honor for me to take one and one half minutes to welcome the friends and family of Jay Sanford. I thank you all for coming today. I can think of more, no more appropriate place than the Jay Sanford Auditorium to remember this great man. And I welcome you to the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences the house that Jay built so that we can celebrate his life, his great contributions, and most of all, his legacy of this remarkable institution which, is going, which has done so much and will do so much more for this nation of ours. So join us for this next few minutes while we reminisce and celebrate. I'm Doc Cook, Director of Administration and Management for uh, the Secretary of Defense, and I've essentially held this job for the last 14 Secretaries of Defense, 
including uh, Secretary of Defense Mel Laird, uh, about the time this university was uh, at best a gleam in Eddie Bear's eye. Under the leadership of Mel, two men, Dave Packard, the first chairman of the Regents, and Tony Carreri, the first university president, joined to select Jay as the first dean of the school. Dave and Tony were astute judges of personal capabilities and character. They saw that Jay had the academic and professional stature, the leadership, and the division to successfully guide the school from infancy to maturity. The vindication of judgment in the brief biography of Jay that is attached to your programs. It speaks for itself. You know, the American poet Longfellow describes the impact of leaders like Jay. Longfellow observes, lives of great men oft remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Footprints in the sands of time. Jay's footprints, his legacy are all over this institution. We're meeting here in the Sanford Auditorium. The curriculum with its emphasis on professional areas likely to be encountered by military physicians bears his imprint. Indeed, many of the faculty sitting here today are Jay's selections. But through the years, what Jay was most proud of in his conversation with me were his students. Jay was indeed a student's dean. It was common for him to spontaneously invite a student into his office for a chat, much to the uh, exasperation of the schedulers and the waiting appointments, because he was genuinely interested in the academic success and the personal welfare of each university student and graduate, and who is willing and act to participant in the student military training. During his tenure, over 2,000 physicians were added to the federal roles. He often told me that incoming classes were better than the classes of prestigious medical institutions, uh, Harvard, Yale, or what have you. And to use a favorite expression of Jay's, as it turns out, he, he was right. In closing, let me return to Longfellow and Footprints. The poet goes on, Footprints that perhaps another, Traveling o'er life's solemn main, A forlorn and weary brother, Seeing may take heart again. That is Jay's legacy. He will be sorely missed. My name is John Powell. I graduated from Uniformed Services in 1987. I've been one or two places since. Jay, San was, Jay Sanford was a man of healthy contrast. The world knew him as a leader of the medical community, a genuine intellect, a million-selling author, and dean of this place. His students, the faculty and friends knew him as a man of small physical stature with a heart much larger than life. I thought if I wrote this, it would help. Hasn't I first saw Jay Sanford on an afternoon like this about 14 years ago after a significantly less than impressive interview. I noticed a group propelling off the uh, tower over in the A building. And uh, as I stopped to watch, I noticed that one of them was significantly smaller and quite a bit grayer than the others. I asked some of the students around, who would that be? And they said, that's the dean. I said, which dean? They said, the dean. An interesting introduction. I came to know Dr. Sanford better while walking 12-mile road marches um, 
during the course of my stay here, testing for the FMB and prepping for other schools, it was amazing to me how a 55-year-old man could remember so much and maintain a continuous conversation about all of it the whole way and finish in 12 miles in less than three hours. My next real interaction with Dr. Sanford was at jump school in the summer of 1984. One of the morning jaunts that we took, it seems he got a little dehydrated, um, a little disoriented, and fell and fractured that finger. He did his own basic first aid and continued to attempt the school. The cadre were not particularly enamored of this first aid. They sent him to the hospital. Needless to say, at a later date, he returned and completed the course. Over the years, Dr. Sanford and myself spoke together in a formal panel situation with Dr. Oster and his human context course for first year students. We discussed our interactions over the years with patients and our own experiences as patients ourselves in the medical system. Dr. Sanford shared some of his most personal insights and some of himself about the practice of medicine and left some, certainly some lasting impressions on me and hopefully some lasting impressions on the first year students in their future endeavors. The only airborne operation I was ever able to attend with Dr. Stanford was at Fort Bragg three years ago. As we left the drop zone, the look of absolute glee on the face of a 65-year-old man was undoubtedly very similar to that of my one-year-old toddler at home. That's how I'll remember Jake Stanford. I'm Harry Holloway. Um, I'm here to talk about our gift, our inheritance from Jay, to notice some of the sorrow, but to also recognize some of the joy of having known him. Now, Jay shared with me his reason for recruiting me. He said he heard about somebody called Crazy Harry, <laughs> and he couldn't do without him. Well, he had to pay for that. But one of the things that we all learned in knowing Jay was the complete and utter embodiment of devotion to this institution, to all of the uniformed services, to the armed services, and to this nation, an embodiment of, I think, that finest attribute of patriotism. I remember a few years ago a troubled time in this university under various attacks, and, uh, and Jay was uh, under attack at the same time, dealing with horrendous problems. And what Jay was preoccupied with at that moment, and what he worked hardest on, was assuring that the infectious disease control that we took over to the Gulf and the care we gave to those deployed soldiers was absolutely the best and that we fully appreciated and were fully prepared for those things that our enemy might do to us in terms of biological warfare. That's what Jay was preoccupied with. That's what he worked on even as he did all the other things of run and go up and down the tower and provide the leadership and everything else here, his concern was how do we take care of those who we put in harm's way. We'll do lots of things in terms of dedicating things to Jay and recognizing him, but we cannot exceed the way in which Jay, by his life, 
has consecrated this institution and consecrated the commitment of all of us who have known him. Uh, Craig Bash. I have a short comment so I don't break into tears. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't be standing here right now, and the school probably wouldn't be here right now if Dr. Sanford hadn't been around. And I want to thank his family and wife for the support they gave him through the years because I know in my own life I have to make decisions on work and family, and he made a lot of decisions along those same lines. So thank you, wife and family. Um, I was Dr. Sanford's uh, troubled child, <laughs> and I crossed his path several times. And they asked me to talk, but they said only talk about one, one story, one situation. So I tried to think of something that kind of had his vision. And one time when the school was under enemy fire, I called back. back. I said, Dr. Sanford, um, what can I do to help? And he said, he said, you're already doing everything. I said, what do you mean? He says, the, um, the success of the school we measured in the accomplishment of the students. And I thought that was a pretty wise concept because it kind of fits all of us here now, because we have faculty and we have students. And um, the future success of the school is measured on our future accomplishments. Um, that's the end of my comments. I'm Ken Kinneman. I came to the Uniformed Services University in the summer of 1975. That was uh, only a few weeks after Jay Sanford had come in March of that same year. Those were fun times as new beginnings often are. Um, but there were not very many of us to partake of those fun things because there just weren't many, very many of us. Oh, there was Ann Howe and there was Mel Mucellus and Bud Turnbull and Vera Bumbach and a few more it seems. And there were the very prominent ones too, like Tony Carreri and Leonard Heaton and David Packard and so forth. But you see, Jay Sanford taught us all. But it was a fun type of thing, such a joy, such a joy. One of the lessons that he taught that I can remember most clearly was that of listening, just listening. So many of us need that skill. So many do not have it. We had our differences from time to time, our differences of opinion. And that was a natural thing. But he would always listen. He would always hear me out, and for that I will always be grateful. At this gathering today, the familiar words of Robert Louis Stevenson are apropos. There are men and classes of men who stand above the common herd, the soldier, the sailor, the shepherd not infrequently, the artist rarely, and even rare still, the clergyman, but the physician almost as a rule. J. Sanford, the physician, the man lends glory to those words. Of course, we will miss him.
do. All right. My name is Sandra Yerkes, and I am one of the Charter Martyrs. For those of you who don't know, that means I was in the first class here at the Uniformed Services University. And I have several vivid memories of Dr. Sanford. The first of one took place in a people's drugstore where we were interviewed, and only Jay Sanford could convince 30 students that this hole in the ground where there was nothing would actually become a medical school. And he was so firm in that vision, he had us all believing that it was right there. I'm sure we were all hallucinating as he sort of drew it out for us and where the labs were going to be and what a fine institution it would be. And that's what it is. That's what it turned out to be. And that was part of this dynamic personality that he had, that he could just set you on fire and, and excite you and, and open up new worlds to your understanding. Well, at least mine. I'm from New Jersey. Maybe my understanding wasn't too great, but he was a, an amazing person. My, my second most vivid memory of Dr. Sanford comes at the time of graduation. And actually, there had been this hubbub of, you know, sort of people whispering about that something unbelievable was going to happen, some great surprise was going to happen. I was just happy I was graduating, let me tell you. But there was this big surprise, and the dean, the dean was going to do this for us. So he kind of, somehow we all got pushed outside, and as we're waiting around, waiting for this something wonderful to happen, here was this, this gray-haired gentleman that started to rappel off the building A. And it, here he was, just sort of sliding down a rope. Now, that's something I hadn't even tried. I mean, he convinced me to go to airborne school, but he had never convinced me to rappel off building A. So I was quite amazed that here's the dean coming down the building. And in retrospect, you know, besides the fact that it was really something surprising, it really spoke a lot about his philosophy, that he would do this before our graduation was an indication to me that this is part of being a military physician, his vision all along, that we would be military doctors, that we would have that, that military sense, that to not be afraid to go out and, and, and participate with the troops and to, to know what it's really like out in the field. I mean, that was Jay Sanford. That's what this is all about. And what a wonderful gift to receive at graduation time. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but now in reflection, I, I can see it. And I really appreciate that. And that's a part of him. <sighs> that will live on inside me. I take a part of him as I leave here. Thank you. Well, I'm Bill Moore. I met Jay the first time in the fall of uh, 1965. Found pretty soon thereafter uh, that Jay was a very special person. And of all of Jay's contributions, I think having prepared a large number of highly competent, well-trained professionals, he perhaps lives up to the challenge that was made to us by General John Wickham when he was Chief of Staff. That the most important legacy of a leader is to prepare a cadre of folks to replace you when you're gone. Jay's qualities of leadership could take up the rest of this morning. I'd like to focus on a few. Very importantly, integrity. Jay's code of ethics was absolutely impeccable. His professionalism, the consummate clinician, the consummate teacher, the consummate researcher. His credibility and competence are known internationally. Jay imposed very high standards on himself. His expectations of mere mortals, I think, were less ambitious. 
But Jay told me once, being a member of the team is optional. But if you elect that option, you'll keep the standard. <laughs> now, Jay never shared with me, at least in any form that I can sort of remember, uh, why he continued to have such a sense of devotion and interest in military medicine and in the Army in particular uh, after his stint in, uh, at Rear. I do know, based on some things he shared with me from time to time, that uh, for those of us who trekked a, uh, a road less traveled and did some unconventional things, that he lived vicariously some of our experiences. I also know that he was very pleased when he came here to the university because he'd been tired of vicarious experience and wanted to taste a little of it in, in the real. Too long denied the uh, outstanding flavor of uh, sea rations. Too long denied the privilege to enjoy MREs, which used to mean meals ready to eat, and a few Iraqi prisoners who were fed that said meals refused by everybody. <laughs> In addition, you think of Jay as someone who operated within paradigms but had no qualms about breaking paradigms. Jay, indeed, was a visionary. He thought outside the box. And Jay's paradigm for me was an ultra-conservative guy with short hair, a history of operational medicine, somewhere to the right of Attila the Hun. I left active duty for a brief time in the middle 70s and faced a midlife crisis. I couldn't afford a red Porsche, so I grew a beard and long hair and wore some outlandish clothes. And Laura, you'll remember, on one occasion at an infectious disease meeting at the Shoreham Omni, I stood in the lobby chatting with the two of them for about 10 minutes, and they were being very kind to the stranger they obviously were talking to. Well, Jay still saw me in that paradigm, and I had to say, Jay, this is Bill. Well, with his phenomenal sense of humor, Jay related that story a number of times later on, said, I never did train that boy right. <laughs> Among Jay's many leadership characteristics were his humanism. Now, I'm sure if you've ever been anywhere with Jay, you saw him pull one of these out of his pocket. Uh, another characteristic of leadership, of course, is time management. And he used this. You know, I've got a Franklin uh, a time manager and a day tender and all those sort of things. I never know where I am. Jay kept everything in here. Another manifestation of his humanism, though, is that when you presented a case to Jay, he did not have an academic detachment from that. And very often, he would jot down the name of the patient and months or years later, ask you how he was. That's Jay as I remember him. Thanks. I'm Barry Walcott. At the reception that followed the 1980 graduation of the USES Charter class, I remarked to Dr. Sanford that uh, this school would uh, be quite a legacy for him. And he replied that uh, any legacy was going to be in the accomplishments of the school's graduates. And so any legacy had just barely started because they'd only graduated about an hour before. Dr. Sanford knew that uh, and believed with all his heart that America's service women and service men deserve uniformed medical officers able to conceive, plan, and execute medical support with the same professionalism, training, and education as those officers who conceive, plan, and execute the mission. During the Gulf War, I heard a visitor to USA say to Dr. Sanford that uh, now the school has proven its value. And Dr. Sanford's response was, now the school has begun to show its value. He went on with the observation that just as it was the service in the Mexican War of the graduates of West Point that showed the value of, began to show the value of that institution to the country, it was 
uh, not the Mexican War exploits of the uh, lieutenants and captains named Grant and Lee and Hancock and Armistead and Jackson and McClellan. People knew about them, but it wasn't until later that the real value of that institution was clear to everyone, but it was clear to many during the war in Mexico, and it was clear to many during the war in the Gulf that those captains and majors and commanders and lieutenant colonels are going to be the people that will be the Lees and the Grants and the Armisteads and the Hancocks of military medicine in the future. Dr. Sanford knew that what he birthed and nurtured at USIS was going to be a national legacy, and I don't believe he ever thought of it as a legacy to himself. And talk of legacies is really talk for the future anyway, for those who may not uh, have ever known Dr. Sanford in person. And this meeting today in this service today is primarily for those who did know him. And each of us, thinking of Dr. Sanford, evokes different unique images, each of us a different facet of this man that was a Renaissance man, as you've heard everyone allude to today. My images include these. Um, the same uh, Rexall drugstore that uh, Sam was talking about. When I went to visit, I didn't go to visit Dr. Sanford, I went to visit Ron Blank, and, and uh, Dr. Sanford was in an office surrounded by building bricks and tiles and pieces of carpet and auditorium chairs and paint swatches. And he was picking out everything that you see around you with as much uh, attention to detail as he picked out the faculty and he picked out the first class. Um, Dr. Sanford insisting on uh, USIS having a Halloween party during the daytime for the student families so that parents that might be unable to uh, take their kid trick-or-treating that night because they had clinical duties or they had studies to do could at least see their kids in their costumes and not have to just hear about it when they went home. Dr. Sanford, uh, as often as he could, wearing a tie tack made out of the miniature of parachutist jump wings, something of which he was incredibly proud. And Dr. Sanford speaking of uh, whenever he had a chance with Navy officers of how his, his crew had saved the buttercup at officer basic training. Dr. Sanford's unbelievable ability to recall by name anyone he'd ever met, the name of their pet snake, their kid, what the hematocrit was if they were a patient, and recall the details of their last meeting and make it, make it sound like it happened yesterday and that he'd known you forever. Dr. Sanford acting as a tra human training aide for a POW exercise, seated next to a fire ant hill at Camp Bullis, Texas in the full summer heat, bound hand and foot, and looking up and saying, can you believe that they actually pay me to have fun like this? <laughs> With Jay's death, each of us has lost something very profound, and it's something that's different for everyone that's here uh, in its character and in, in what it means to us individually. But we all share in having known a man that is not going to leave a legacy, but is going to leave thousands of legacies. And those legacies are going to be in the students that graduated from here, the students that he's touched in other schools, and the students that will graduate from here and will know of Dr. Sanford only by the other legacies that came before him. Thank you. I'm Robert Holland. In 1988, I was a young staff sergeant, a special forces medic, who had dreamed about becoming a physician. Due to personal circumstances at that time, I knew that it was only a dream, and I had set my sights on becoming a physician's assistant. In fact, I was trying to earn my AA degree through night school so I could apply to the Army's Physician Assistant Program. I was attending an advanced trauma life support course set up with special operations medics in mind when I was introduced to a gentleman by the name of Dean Sanford. We talked for a few minutes, and on understanding my interest in medicine, he suggested that I look into the Uniformed Services University, which I had never heard of. I did that, and a couple of years later, I was at another ATLS course, and I met Dr. Sanford again. And I told him, I thanked him for letting me know about the university. It wasn't until I was actually applying to USIS that I realized that Dean was not his first name, but his title. <laughs> and that he, in fact, was the dean of the School of Medicine. <laughs> and it wasn't until I got to USIS that 
that I realized that that nifty little antimicrobial handbook I used to carry around as a medic was written by the same person using a different alias, J.P. Sanford, M.D. Regretfully, by the time I got to USIS, Dr. Sanford had retired, and I was only able to see him when he came as a guest speaker. My personal experience with Dr. Sanford has altered my life forever. But in addition to his pivotal influences on me, he's had an incredible influence on military medicine and the military, not to mention civilian medicine also with his, with his little handbook. The university, the Department of Military Medicine, ATLS courses set up specifically for special operations personnel are only a few of the areas where his impact has been felt. These are all very unique entities. They provide educational opportunities that are not available anywhere else in this nation, opportunities that are crucial to our military medical forces. Although Dr. Sanford has once again moved on to new horizons, the legacy has, he has left behind will lead us in military medicine into the 21st century. There's people who view USIS as Dr. Sanford's legacy. I do not. I do not believe that he dreamed of cold brick buildings in Bethesda, Maryland. I believe that what he dreamed of were the warm hearts and minds, young men and women, the military physicians from USIS who truly represent what his ideals were and the best of this university. As long as we, the students and graduates of this university, continue to recognize his impact on us and understand the honor and the responsibility of being able to say, I am a graduate of the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, his legacy will never die. Let us stand for the benediction. And let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what we have seen and heard testifies of a life that was full and complete. Of his richness, he has touched us and made our lives more complete. Such a life never dies but lives on as a memorial as to what great men are all about. The scripture tells us that a man's work shall follow him. Well, Lord, we're praying that you open your gates to their fullest extent, for a great man is about to enter. We thank you for this time to celebrate his life both now and forever. Amen. We're asking all of the friends and guests to follow the family and special guests to the plaza for the dedication of the memorial stone.
charge. Charge. 